You're listening to Reach MD, and this is Lipid Lumination, sponsored by the National Lipid Association. I'm Dr. Alan Brown, your host, and joining me today is my good friend, Dr. Peter P. Toth, MD, PhD, who's the Director of Preventative Cardiology at the CGH Medical Center in uh, Sterling Rock Falls, Illinois, and he's clinical professor at the University of Illinois School of Medicine in Peoria and the current president of the National Lipid Association. Peter, thanks a lot for taking time out of your crazy schedule to talk with us. My pleasure, Alan. Glad to be here. So today we're going to discuss some uh, new therapies for lowering LDL. Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on whether LDL should still remain the primary target, especially in light of some of these newer trials. And are statins going to continue to be the miracle drugs that uh, that we seem to think they are? So tell us about where our statins role, where is LDL in today's world? And then we'll explore some of the new treatments that are being investigated. I think there's no question that statins are going to be the mainstay of therapy for lowering LDL. Um, Basically, from now until the end of forever, they are probably one of the most intensively studied classes of medication uh, known to us in the last 100 years. And we know that basically uh, virtually any type of patient with a risk factor history benefits from statin therapy. Now, some of that gets a little controversial, but some of it also gets silly, uh, given the nature of some of the arguments that have been leveled against statins. But in the world of cardiology, do we stand by statins in both primary and secondary prevention? And the answer is absolutely. Will LDL remain the primary target of therapy in patients with dyslipidemia? And I think that is going to be a little problematic the preponderance of evidence that is emerging from a number of analyses certainly support the conclusion that non-HDL is actually a better predictor than is LDL for future cardiovascular events, and reducing non-HDL actually provides better risk reduction. So why would that be? Well, LDL is an atherogenic lipoprotein, but non-HDL incorporates all of the atherogenic lipoprotein fractions in serum and is actually a very, very sensitive marker um, or surrogate of total atherogenic lipoprotein burden in serum. What, what is NSEP going to do? I truly have no idea. Um, but I think a lot of people are moving toward really targeting non-HDL over LDL uh, because if non-HDL still is not at NSEP risk stratified target based on ATP3, certainly there is considerable residual risk that can still be tackled. Yeah, so that's interesting, Peter, because, you know, I certainly concur that non-HDL is, it has a lot of luster. It's an easy number to calculate. It gives you a better idea of uh, atherosclerotic risk than LDL, especially in people that have high triglycerides. But do you think the aim high data and the ACCORD data may have had a negative effect on moving in that direction uh, in terms of guidelines, because I'm not aware of any study where we do what the guidelines tell you to do currently, which is get the LDL to target, and then if the triglycerides are elevated, calculate non-HDL and treat that as a secondary target. I mean, that certainly makes sense for all the reasons you said, but I'm not aware of any clinical trial where they've actually been able to get that group of patients and study treating the residual risk from non-HDL. Yeah, and, and that's a good point, because actually AIM High very strongly supports the conclusion that non-HDL is important. Um, Now, they haven't teased this out in multivariate regression analysis yet, but it's clear that when you look at a patient population, as they did name high, where essentially atherogenic lipoprotein burden across the board was at target, namely LDL around 70, non-HDL around 100, ApoB at 80, the adjuvant use of niacin had no impact on events, at least over the three years of follow-up. Um, so there you have a study where everybody's atherogenic lipoprotein burden is right where it needs to be based on NSEP, ACC, ADA, and AHA guideline recommended targets, and adding an additional drug has no benefit. So um, I do believe that irrespective of baseline triglyceride, non-HDL really should be a target, not just in patients with baseline triglycerides over 200. 
Yeah, and maybe that subgroup analysis of Accord for the people with the elevated triglycerides and low HDL, so the people with the residual high non-HDL on statins, sure looked like those people got a benefit from from adding fibrates, even though it didn't quite reach statistical significance. Yeah, and I think that is also very reasonable because when you look across clinical trials, including Helsinki Heart Study, the Biza Fibrate Infarction Prevention Study done in Israel, uh, you look at field, and then you also take a look at these patients with high triglycerides, low HDL, in Accord, there is remarkable consistency, not only in the fact that those patients do appear to um, achieve some benefit from uh, use of fibrate therapy, but also the size effect appears to be pretty consistent study to study. So with that said, those statins remain the primary target. There's still more studies that need to be done regarding residual risk in people who have LDL down at target. But as you know and I know, we've got lots of patients that either can't take statins or on statins, uh, they don't reach their LDL targets. So let's get to the next issue, which you're an expert at, and uh, I'm looking forward to your insights, which are novel mechanisms for lowering LDL beyond statins. So could you tell us a little bit about what kind of options are out there and what's being investigated at the present time? Sure. So if we go beyond cholesterol absorption inhibition or bile acid binding resin therapy, um, we have three new emerging drug classes, which are all moving into phase three investigations. Uh, But just a couple caveats. I think, uh, number one, in order for any of these drugs to be approved, they're going to have to go through very rigorous, hard outcome trials to demonstrate that their capacity to improve endpoint reduction beyond baseline ongoing statin therapy. Uh, And second, they're going to have to demonstrate very rigorous safety profiles uh, so that there is no signal for untoward adverse events from any of these drugs. And I think a primary concern for any of the emerging drugs uh, will, of course, continue to be risk for hepatotoxicity uh, and the potential for myotoxicity and the like. So they're going to have to pass very rigorous, hard outcome um, endpoints and then also demonstrate safety in a very rigorous fashion. And all of these studies are going to have to be done against a background of statin therapy. So the groups are going to be statin alone versus statin plus the emerging drug. And we know that based on previous clinical trials, it is a very high bar uh, to show augmented efficacy beyond statin therapy, but this is what's going to have to happen. So what are some emerging therapies? Well, there are three that I think are very exciting. The first has to do with the inhibition of PCSK9 activity using antibodies. Now, the enzyme PCSK9 is an enzyme that is responsible for regulating the half-life of expression of the LDL receptor on the surface of hepatocytes. In the presence of statin therapy, we know that the LDL receptor is upregulated, which helps to clear LDL from the systemic circulation. PCSK9, uh, if there is a loss of function mutation, uh, when you look at genome-wide association studies, this type of loss of function polymorphism correlates with reduced risk for cardiovascular events because it allows for very prolonged expression of the LDL receptor on the surface of the hepatocyte, and this leads to a vacuum cleaner-like effect with augmented capacity for removing LDL from the circulation. And so these PCSK9 antibodies neutralize the enzyme and inhibit the enzyme uh, from inducing the uptake and proteasomal uh, breakdown of the receptor. And so you get very long half times for expressing the LDL receptor and considerable augmentation of capacity for clearing LDL. There are at least four such antibodies in clinical development by a number of companies, and the preliminary data is actually very, very promising uh, with really pretty good safety profile and some pretty impressive capacity to reduce LDL, ApoB, as well as non-HDL. 
another important emerging drug class um, has to do with the inhibition of microsomal triglyceride transfer protein. So let's take the example of uh, some lipid entering, say, a jejunal enterocyte or a hepatocyte. And in order for this lipid to be assimilated into either, say, a chylomicron particle or a VLDL particle, the MTP enzyme has to be able to assimilate triglyceride, and this triglyceride has been packaged into chylomicrons VLDL along with cholesterol esters, um, and of course they are uh, put into um, this lipoprotein and secreted. And what the MTP inhibition uh, therapy does is it blocks the capacity of MTP to drive uh, triglyceride biosynthesis as well as either chylomicron or VLDL particle formation. And if you decrease the capacity to produce and secrete VLDL, this will, of course, reduce the availability of cholesterol ester within the circulation, reduce the availability of VLDL. And we know that VLDL is ultimately converted via the enzyme lipoprotein lipase to IDL and then LDL. So with less substrate available, you're going to see less LDL formed in serum. And that's exactly what you see. And uh, there is one drug being developed for this use, and it too is showing some really favorable capacity for reducing atherogenic lipoprotein burden um, with a pretty good safety profile. A lot of work needs to be done, but things are looking good so far. Another very interesting drug class has to do with anti-sense technology, and this is where mypomersin comes in. Mypomersin um, is different because when you think about statin therapy uh, or the use of, say, an MTP inhibitor, what you're doing is you're shutting down enzymes. In the case of a statin, you're inhibiting HMG reductase. In the case of an MTP inhibitor, obviously the microsomal triglyceride transfer protein. Well, when you use antisense technology, you're, you're backing up a step or two because what you're doing is you're blocking the capacity of the messenger RNA for apoprotein B to be expressed because you're forming this Watson-Crick type double helix with the mRNA, so it can no longer be translated into protein by the ribosome. And this is a very, very creative, very ingenious approach toward reducing ApoB production. And if there's less ApoB, there's going to be less incorporation of ApoB into VLDL particles, reduce capacity for VLDL biosynthesis and secretion, and of course, LDL cholesterol will decrease. And that is exactly what you see. And mypomersin is moving right along um, and is also in phase three. And what I think is very important is that not only do these drugs provide new options for treating elevated LDL over and above statin therapy, uh, but as you point out, there are a lot of patients who simply don't tolerate statins. And these drugs, because of the size of their impact on serum atherogenic lipoproteins offer a whole new series of avenues through which to treat these folks. And then if you've got patients who are on statin therapy doing well with them, but they're pretty much maxed out, then you can provide drugs such as this, assuming that they are approved and, and meet regulatory requirements based on safety and outcomes. Uh, it's going to help a whole lot more people get to their NSEP risk stratified targets for um, lipid fractions such as LDL and non-HDL. So let me ask you something, Peter, after that eloquent explanation of the three new classes of drugs, and I know some of them can get up to 70% reduction in LDL, which is awfully exciting. But I was thinking the other day about azetamibe and the bad rap it got because it, uh, was the studies were designed to look at a statin at a given number of milligrams versus statin plus azetamibe, which only added another 17% or so reduction in LDL. And then it was hard to show any difference in outcomes with that relatively small additional drop in LDL. And, uh, of course, that was uh, advertised as maybe azetamibe doesn't do anything. But isn't the bigger clinical question, could low-dose statin plus azetamibe 
compete in terms of outcomes to, say, 80 milligrams of a statin where we'd be worried about more toxicity. So I, I wonder your thoughts on these new drugs. Uh, we may be stuck with a, a, a clinical trial model that doesn't really answer what we want to know cl- in the real world, which is can we get away with lower doses of statins and add second agents to get adequate LDL lowering, and will we get the same outcomes as using very high-dose statins alone? Yeah, and, and that's a terrific question. And I think, as you allude to the enhanced trial, um, certainly there were a lot of issues there, but I think the most important one was that the bulk of the patients had already been chronically treated with lipid-lowering medications, including high-dose statin therapy. The baseline CMT was very low at 0.69, um, and essentially... Um, if you want to see regression, you have to have lipid in the vessel wall to pull out of there, and they didn't have anything, essentially, to pull out of there. So it turned out to be a negative study, but if you look at the SANS trial done in Native Americans and you compare high-dose statin therapy to low-dose statin plus azetamibe, certainly the impact on CIMT in that study was equivalent in the two groups. And if you look at the SHARP trial, uh, most certainly, again, the magnitude of risk reduction in patients with chronic kidney disease was, in fact, directly proportional to the magnitude of LDL reduction. And similarly, in the SEAS trial, in patients with aortic valve stenosis, if you look at the first and second tertiles of disease severity uh, and look at event rate reduction as a function of LDL reduction, basically those two groups fall right on the cholesterol clinical trialists uh, meta-analysis line once again confirming that magnitude of risk reduction was directly proportional to magnitude of LDL reduction. So I, for one, uh, certainly support the use of azetamibe. Um, But as you point out, these newer drugs uh, provide us with an opportunity for a whole new group of patients, namely uh, the patient who perhaps can tolerate a low dose of a statin, and we're glad that they tolerate at least that, but then would... Uh, hopefully benefit from the adjuvant use of some of these emerging medications. Uh, And, of course, if a patient doesn't tolerate a statin at all, it's always wonderful to have other treatment options uh, that have very powerful capacities for LDL and non-HDL reduction. So many thanks to our guest, Dr. Peter Toth, for your insights regarding novel therapies of LDL and also all the other things we talked about today. As always, Peter, it was a pleasure having you. I'm Dr. Alan Brown, and you've been listening to Lipid Illumination, sponsored by the National Lipid Association on ReachMD. Be sure to visit our website at ReachMD.com, which features podcasts of this and other series, and thank you for listening.